Good evening. We want to thank you for taking your valuable time to be with us here at the Luxahoma Church of Christ as we are continuing to record uh, Bible lessons uh, that you could use throughout your week. And we hope that these lessons certainly will be beneficial and uplifting. And we uh, pray that as you use them, uh, that God will, uh, will bless you as well as bless all of us as we strive to get through such a difficult time, and not only in our community and our nation, but uh, really the entire world. And so we're grateful uh, that we have this technology, that we can uh, be together in this way uh, for a, a period of Bible study. And uh, again, we hope that this will be beneficial to you. We will continue our uh, Wednesday night class on, uh, on worship as we uh, are studying the act of prayer uh, as one of the five acts in which we engage when we assemble ourselves together for worship. And so we'll continue through that study this evening. And uh, again, we hope that, uh, that you uh, will benefit from this and we are thankful again that you have joined us for this period of time. Uh, let's begin with a, with a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we are so very grateful for the opportunity that we've had to study. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for thy holy and divine word and the power uh, that it has to change our lives, to guide our lives, and certainly uh, allow us to continue to have a relationship with thee that's pleasing and acceptable. We pray, Heavenly Father, for this congregation at Luxahoma. We're thankful for her faithful leaders. We're thankful, Father, for every member that makes up this place. And we pray, Father, that truth will always go out from her foundations. And we pray, Father, that thou will continue to uh, watch over us and bless us. For those who are sick and afflicted, especially those, Father, who are uh, suffering from this, this uh, pandemic, we pray for them and we pray for that providential hand of of healing and strength and comfort uh, to be with them as they go through this difficult time. We pray, Father, for every member at, at Luxahoma through the difficulties that some are having with uh, the sickness and family as well as our, as our own loss of loved ones. And we pray, Father, that Thou will continue to, to bless us and, and, and provide the things in which we need. As we go through this period of study, we pray, Father, that, that as, as we do, that we will handle thy word aright and certainly be able to uh, say that it was better for us to have studied, that we may be granted every intended blessing. For this is our prayer in Christ's name, and amen. If you remember, as we've been going through our study, that we have been studying the act of prayer and that we looked as to see that it is a most crucial thing for uh, the life of a Christian. It is our way in which we can communicate and have communion with God in the fact that we can bring before Him our prayers of thanksgiving and praise and certainly the prayers of supplications and, and certainly the things in which we have need and we pray all of these things in accordance to the will of God but at the very same time, we understand that that prayer is reserved for those who are, who are in a relationship, a faithful relationship with God. I think the last time we met, we had introduced Matthew chapter 6. And we invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 now as we will use this as the text for our lesson tonight. You remember that we oftentimes have heard it referred to as the uh, model prayer. I, I believe it's a, rather a how-to prayer. I, I don't think that God ever meant for this to be uh, repeated in some type of ceremonial or ritualistic way, but rather it was a, a guide or a how-to manual for us to pray. So when Last week when we left off, we were looking at the very first point. And if you'll remember the notes that were handed out, we are on page number 20 of those notes, that we looked at number one, that how should one pray? Well, when we look at verse number five, we see how we are not to pray. 
For in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5 here, it is recorded, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now, public prayer is not being condemned here, so let's, let's think about this. This is, this is more of a personal prayer in the fact that, that this prayer is going to be offered to God and, and it's not to be done in some type of boisterous and, and standout way as somehow uh, we are on the same level with God, but rather that this public, uh, that this prayer should be in the fact that it, it includes the relationship that the individual has, that he has this outstanding privilege that he's able to go before Almighty God in prayer. His prayers are always to be as if God, if it's just God and Him individually, and He is the only one listening. Look at verse number 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter the, into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And so this is a very personal Thing. This is a very personal part of our relationship with God. In the fact, it's me talking to God. It's me bringing my praises, my thanksgivings, my supplications. It's, it's me, even when I cannot utter the words that, that might be in my mind because I might be so distressed, or, or the fact is that when I have the opportunity to talk to Him, that, that it can be a time of, of certainly emotion and, and it can be a time of, uh, of, of rejoicing, but at the very same time, this is very personal. And so Jesus is telling his disciples that, that it's not for you to stand out in a, on a street corner. It's not for you to stand in the synagogues in order to be heard of everyone else, but rather this is between you and God and between you and him alone. Jesus said that God shall open you or, or shall reward you openly in verse 6. The fact is that we're rewarded by the fact that He hears us. Uh, and we know that He answers our prayers. We studied that in previous classes. But the idea here again is the fact that this is between me and God. Now look at verse number 7. And He says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions. As the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Vain repetitions. Uh, there's been a lot of different definitions given as to what this means. Some people think that it means that when somebody leads a prayer, whether it's privately or publicly, that, that they use the same words over and over and over and over again. And while it may be inclusive of that, it, that's not really the definition of vain repetitions, but rather vain repetitions are words or phrases that are thoughtlessly repeated. That they're thoughtlessly repeated. In other words, it's something maybe they've practiced or maybe it's something that they've memorized in the sense that, uh, that on... Uh, uh, just without giving any thought or any consideration to, to who the audience is here, in this case being God, that they would approach Him in such a way that that seems very common and it seems very simplistic and it seems very, very cold in the sense that we would use the same words or phrases thoughtlessly as we bring them before God. Now, again, the context here is not talking about public prayer. We hear men pray a lot publicly, whether it's at the Lord's Supper table or whether it's an opening prayer in our assemblies or a closing prayer in our assemblies or before class or, or what have you. But it's not necessarily a thoughtless repeti a repetition just because someone utters the same words, perhaps, in any particular prayer. Maybe he has searched for ways to say this, and this is absolutely the best way he knows how to say it. 
Therefore, would that be thoughtless? Absolutely not. Would it be vain or, or empty or worthless? Well, we'll know because there's a lot of consideration that has been given for this particular time in his communication with God. But one must offer his prayer. He, he, he must offer it with this, with this outpouring of his soul. He, he, he offers it in sincerity. In other words, he, he leaves nothing to be hidden, but rather he pours out everything before God. Uh, look at this in Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 6. Here the Apostle Paul writes, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving... Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Again, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Now, when you and I, we think about pouring our hearts and our sincerity out to God and in our personal lives and our personal prayers to God. It's easy to remember our Lord praying in the Garden of Gethsemane that, that He was hours away from the cross and the fact that, that when He would go into the garden that He would fall upon His face and that, that He would pray in such a way that the agony not only can be seen in the words that describe it, but the fact that it could be heard in the ears who heard it. There's no doubt that God knew the pain and the suffering that His Son was going through. And all of that was seen through the writings of the accounts of this prayer, but at the same time, He brought everything to God in this manner. The Bible tells us that God knows exactly what we need. And some might even say, well, why even pray? Because God wants us to bring everything to Him. When you look at verse number 8 of our text, and again, we're still in Matthew chapter 6, He said, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. And so, who is the them here? Uh, therefore, be not like them. Well, he, he's talking about the individuals who, who were praying in a way that they were standing in the synagogues or they were, they were allowing themselves to be heard. And it's from this boisterous mindset that, that somehow that they are better than those who are around them. But here, Matthew records... The words of Jesus, he says, Be ye not therefore like unto them. Your Father knows what you need even before you ask it. He's not saying that there's no need to ask, but not in the way that some in that day were doing, but rather it was in a way that God knows that your outpouring of your heart, the sincerity that's attached to it, and the fact is that you want Him and you to have the relationship that you have because of your trust and dependence upon Him. God knows what man needs. And because He does, we have great confidence to come before Him. Now, that shows us from the text of, of how one should pray. So He prays not for the sake of impressing men, but rather that He... Praise to God with the mindset that I am pouring everything out to Him. Now, when we come to verse number 9, we come to our second point, and the fact is that, that to, we see to whom should one pray. Look at verse 9 here. He says, after this manner, now he's describing the prayer. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father, which art in heaven. Now, it's amazing to me that when you look at the relationship between Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, and God the Father, that throughout the New Testament, and if I remember right, that 168 times... When Jesus refers to God, 
he refers to him as his father. 168 times. And when he refers to, to God, he refers to him as his father. Now, for those of you who have been in this class and we're on page 21, I listed several here concerning the prayers of Jesus and his reaching out to God and, and in the way that he did. Notice this in John chapter 17 and verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes and said, Father, the hour is come. Uh, notice John 17 and verse number 11. Here he says, and, I'm, I am, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Notice verse 25. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Now we go back to Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 26. Now you remember, this is just a short time before he's crucified, and it says here, And when he went a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou. And then in verse 42 of that same chapter, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Now, I'm not going to be so crude and disrespectful to anyone who stands up and leads a prayer and addresses our God as Lord or he addresses our God as, as God. I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. But I think that when our Lord addressed our Father, he leaves us a great example. And especially when he was looking to our, his disciples, it makes me wonder if that's not what he wanted when he said, when, when ye pray thee, pray our Father who art in heaven. And then we see Jesus giving those examples that we have just seen when he called him Father or he called him Holy Father or O Righteous Father or O My Father. When we see all of these things come to pass, then we begin to see just what Jesus saw in God. He saw His Father. Now when you and I, when we pray, whether it be privately or whether it be in the public assembly of, our, uh, of, our, of the saints who have gathered together, that when our prayer is led, who are we addressing? Well, we're addressing the Father. And so, so that, it, that it's clear, maybe it would be a great practice if we took it to that, to that side of it and, and, and address God in that way. Again, not being dogmatic about it and not saying that, that addressing God as Lord or, or, or God the Father as, as God. It's just when you see the example of Jesus, uh, there seems to be a, a distinction here that m maybe that might be the best way to do it. Well, when we think of praying to our Father, we do know that Jesus was eliminating other things. He was eliminating uh, Jesus. Uh, he, he didn't address prayers to himself, or he did not address his disciples to, to address Jesus, nor did he address his disciples to pray to the Holy Spirit. But rather, he wanted their directions pointed to the Father. And there's a specific reason for this. Because when we pray to the Father, that's to whom we should pray, but we should pray in the name of Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ or, or by the authority of Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul said, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all 
in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So there's a distinction here. So here we are, and said, so whatever you do in word or deed, whatever you teach or whatever you practice, you do it in the name of Jesus or by the authority of Jesus, doing what? Giving thanks. Giving thanks to who? Giving thanks to God the Father. So, so there's a reason we don't pray to Jesus, because we have to pray through Jesus or in His name or by the authority in order to give the thanks or the praise to God the Father. Now, notice John chapter 14, in verses 13 and 14, he says, And what shall you, whatever you shall ask, listen to him, in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 13 and 14. Go back and look at this. If you, whatever you shall ask in my name, he says, that will I do. Why? That the Father may be glorified. Well, if, if you pray to me, then where's the glorification of the Father? But rather, if you pray through me or by my authority to pray, then God's glorified in the process as you pray or do those things by my name. Uh, notice another one in John chapter 15 and verse 16. He says, ye, ha ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John 15, 16. So whatever you ask of the Father, how do we do that? In my name, Jesus said, or in the name of Jesus. And so we, we understand that he's given a great distinction here, that the prayers are aimed at the Father and are going through or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Let's look at one more here. In John chapter 16, beginning at verse number 23. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. John 16, verses 23 and 24. Now go back and look at this. He says, whatsoever shall ask of who? The Father. Uh, whatever you ask the Father in my name. So we have do, two distinctions here. The, the aim of the prayer and the authority by which the prayer is made. The aim, God the Father. The authority or by the authority of God the Son, or Jesus the Christ. And so, this eliminates a very flippant, haphazard, uh, this eliminates a, a very communistic way of communicating to God, but rather that it's very distinctive, it's very personal, uh, and it accomplishes a great deal because we are including everything that God said to include. You pray to me in the name of my son, and he says, I will hear you. The third part of this, as we consider to whom should we pray, there is a very distinctive part that not only is it our aim to, to pray to the Father, and it's, it, that it's through Jesus Christ or by the authority of Jesus Christ, we have to remember the mindset that God wants us, that God wants us to use in our approach. Uh, do we ask according to our will? Or do we ask according to the will 
of Almighty God. Well, let's look at this for just a moment. Look at 1 John chapter 5 at verse number 14. 1 John 5 at verse 14. And here John writes, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. This is the confidence that we have. This is our dependence, our trust upon God, that as we go before Him, we pray directly to Him through the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ, but we do it with the mindset that it's not my will that is being elevated here, but the will of God. And he says that if we do that according to His will, it says He hears us. So what's the process of elimination here? Well, if we pray a prayer to God and we even have the aim correctly and we pray through the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ, but if we're praying for it to be according to our own will, the process of elimination says He doesn't hear us. You remember the prayer that we read a few moments ago of Jesus concerning the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, let this cup pass from me, not my will, but thine. Jesus wanted the will of the Father to be done even under the most crucial, physical, human elements that could be present. He wanted the Father's will to be done in all things. One more passage and we'll conclude this part of our Bible study tonight. When we go back to Matthew chapter 26 and look at verse number 39, again we go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. And here Jesus said as he went a little further and he fell on his face saying, O my Father, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou wilt be done. So under those considerations, I think that we can truly see where we are in our prayer life to God or perhaps where we should be in our prayer life to God. All right, let's recap very quickly. How should one pray? Well, he should pray our Father who art in heaven. His prayers should always be as if it's just between Him and God. And our prayers should be minus of vain repetitions and understanding that God knows what we need even before we ask it. And then, to whom should we pray? Well, we pray to our Father who art in heaven. And with this prayer to our Father, that we do it in the name of Jesus Christ or through or by the authority of. And with that mindset that says that I want it to be according to your will and not mine own. And if we have that understanding as we approach God in prayer, whether it be in our own homes and our private prayers in which we approach Jesus and, or approach God in secret, in the name of Jesus, according to the will of God, then there's no doubt that the Bible tells us with great confidence that God hears us in those times. And even in the worship assembly, where faithful men stand before and they pray on behalf of the congregation, leading us, leading our minds or directing our minds in this very way, the prayers are offered the same to the Father in the name of Jesus according to His will. Thank you for being with us tonight. We look forward to when we can be together again. And if we can answer any questions or do anything to help you in any way, we hope that you'll let us know. Thank you, and may God bless you.